Welcome to Live with Marketers, our talk show where we talk shop with some of the brightest minds in marketing. I'm Ty Heath, Director of Market Engagement at our LinkedIn B2B Institute. We partner with academics and practitioners to investigate how marketers can create more value. Today, I'm so excited and I just can't hide it because it's our annual reveal of our 2022 trends for contrarian marketers, our B2B trends. And I'm excited to reveal those B2B trends with you today with my work fam, John Lombardo and Peter Weinberg. So we'll bring them in in just a moment. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. So the full recording will be available right after the event. So it'll be available for you to check it out, share it. Also, we want to hear from you. So if you have comments along the way and questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. We'll be looking for those and we'll do live Q&A at the end. And then you can also follow along on LinkedIn and Twitter using hashtag live with marketers. Now let's get to the show. Let's bring in my work fam, John and Peter. Yay! Yay! We're back. We're back. Yay, we're back. Round of applause. We're back. Round of applause. We're back. Round of applause. Yay! Happy New Year, fam. This is our first show of the year, our first live with marketers of the year. How long do you think I can get away with saying Happy New Year? I'm gonna milk it as long as I can. Like, you know, Larry, there's a curb your enthusiasm episode about this, of course, Ty. I think oh, seven. Is there? Well, seven days is the rule that was established. So you're only you're seven. Happy. Only seven days. That's what he said. That That's very good. Like, don't kill the messenger. That's what he said. Oh, but Ty, okay. Ty, I think you could go with like happy old year after seven days and then run that from like days <laughs> eight to 365. So I think we got you covered here, actually. Okay, with the old and the new. I'm going to try that and see how that goes. Well, in the, in the spirit of this new season, this new year, and for the audience to get to know all of us, I just want to ask the question, do you have a marketing and or non-marketing potential New Year's resolution in mind? And I actually want to toss that question to our audience as well. Like, do you have one? Let us know what it is in the chat. And Peter, let's start with you. Do you have a, a marketing or non-marketing New Year's resolution? To mm, share? Great question, Ty. Uh, I would say my New Year's resolution is to work out less. Uh, you know, working out more, that's a consensus opinion. I'm giving you the contrarian take, work out less. Also, Ty, you know, nobody actually does their New Year's resolution. So if my New Year's resolution is to work out less, I might end up working out more. So that's really where I'm at at this point in the year. Very good. Very much in line with our contrarian takes. Today. Uh, we got on brand. Always I on like brand. It. I like it. John, what are, do you have a, a New Year's resolution? Ty, I'm so glad you asked. I actually did an analysis of all of my past resolutions and I found that I haven't kept a single one. So I don't have any personal resolutions because they are not worth the resolutions that I did not keep. But on a, um, on a professional front, I guess it's to read more about advertising history or the history of mm -hmm. advertising. So I'm not into personal resolutions because I have failed there, but possibly I will succeed on the professional front and read more about the history of advertising. Nice, nice. And you can sh you can share that with us. Uh, so guess what mine is? So in the spirit of not keeping our resolutions, I'm actually reading a book about how you can keep your resolutions. And it's called How to Change by Katie Melkman, The Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. So she's be behavioral science. And I'm like, maybe she can help us keep our resolutions. So recommend. I just started reading it. If anyone's read it, let us know what you think about that but my resolution is to read more about behavioral science this year it sounds like she could help john a lot you know john by the way was that analysis peer reviewed or you know how could you would you be willing to share the data on that yeah it was single source data collected over the course of multiple years okay. it's replicated in multiple countries over okay. multiple decades okay. yeah that checks out awesome. we'll just we'll check this behind yeah the yeah so it sounds yeah it sounds firm sounds firm Okay, so with that, uh, we'll bring you two back later. Let's get into the content. And we have to start with the contrarian matrix. So this contrarian matrix is the mental model that underpins 
this B2B trends work we've done over the years. And it's what we use to identify great ideas to invest in. So you can see marketers always ask, what is everyone else doing? We think the better question to ask is what is nobody doing? So just to break down this contrarian matrix, you can either be consensus with the crowd or contrarian against the crowd, you can be wrong or right. Now, when you're wrong, there's no value to get there because you're wrong. And then when you're consensus and right with your ideas, that's where everyone's playing. So the value gets competed away. So simply put, what you want to do is what no one else is doing and be right about it. So that's how you get all the value. And that's what we're actually talking about today. All the trends we're talking about today fall into this contrarian and right space. And that's what we're looking to share with you so you can get that competitive edge. And so that brings us to our first trend today called the 95-5 rule. And so some of you may already be familiar with this one, but it's so fabulous and it's so amazing that we wanted to bring it back for you today. So here's how the story goes. So two famous ad execs got in a car and one says to the other, I saw an ad for Aston Martin and I bought this car. And the second one says, well, Aston Martin hasn't been advertising for years. What are you even talking about? And the first one says, well, I actually saw the ad when I was five. And so as you think about that, the reason why this is so powerful is that the best ads drive sales over a long period of time. They build memories that still influence us years later. So looking at, looking at this slide, you can see this is especially important given that 95% of your potential buyers aren't ready to buy today. They're out market, but will be in market at some point in the future. And this isn't just a theory. So seeing here, 75% of companies buy computers once every four years, 80% of companies change banking services every five years, and even in B2C, 90% of consumers buy cars every 10 years. So in Aston Martin's case, though, it's once in a lifetime. So the contrarian and right idea here is that most buyers are future buyers. They're not at the top or the bottom of an imaginary marketing funnel. They're either in market or out market. And that's the principle of this 95-5 rule. That's why we believe flipping the funnel on its side, as you can see here in the slide, is actually the more effective mental model to look at. So what you wanna do is focus your lead generation efforts on the 5% of buyers that are in market today, but then invest heavily in brand to prime your future buyers. The buyers are either in market or out market. So that's how we want to think about the met met this mental model, little tongue tied there. And then this is actually a better model to explain to your CFO because it aligns with current and future cash flows. So to wrap this trend up, this is a key, key, key trend to grow your brand. Follow this 95-5 rule. Advertise to people who aren't in the market now so that when they do enter the market, your brand is the one they're familiar with. So that brings us to our second trend of the day, situational awareness. And so to introduce this trend, let's talk about memories. Let's talk about memories, y'all. Memories are highly situational. So there's a fascinating study that looks at the relationship between situation and recall. And one experiment showed that if we learn vocabulary underwater, our recall is best when we're underwater again. That's why when you train for something, you, you go to the place you're gonna train before you actually have to perform there. It's like the, the, it firms up the memory. In other words, memories rarely exist independent of situations. Most conscious memory recall happens as a result of that trigger. And when it comes to brand, those memories are the same. So we tend to remember some brands over others, depending on that situation we find ourselves in when we're in the market to purchase. So here's another great book for everyone to put on their list. Uh, Phil Barden explains this phenomenon in his book, Decoded. So he ran an experiment asking participants, which ice cream brand comes to mind generally versus which ice cream brand comes to mind as a dessert at Christmas. And so if you think about it that way, you have 
results varying dramatically, two different situations. It's a situation that acts as a frame and that significantly affects which ice cream brand comes to mind. So as we think about this, I just wanna break this down because situation is actually a really powerful determinant of the brands we remember, but most marketers right now aren't thinking about measuring situation today. At best, what marketers are measuring is brand awareness, and even that is, is lacking in B2B. So we've got, we've got some work to do, folks. So it's not about whether buyers know your brand. What matters is whether buyers know or think of your brand when they enter a buying situation. And so the, looking at this funnel here, this can be best explained by the share of mind funnel. So most marketers are at the bottom. They want to know if category buyers know their brand. So for example, if you're looking at the coffee category, awareness asks you the question, how many coffee brands can you name? So then you could graduate from there to salience. That's the next step. So when primed to think about the coffee category, which brand comes to mind first? That's the brand that's top of mind and it's often the largest competitor in the category. For example, I know maybe some of you are thinking about coffee right now and you're putting Starbucks into the chat because that would be what comes to mind for many people. But the real question we need to ask is, which coffee brand comes to mind when you're on your way to work versus on the weekend versus when you're catching up with a friend? Because now these are very different situations or what we call category entry points. And these are the things that likely influence the brand that most readily comes to mind. So while Starbucks may be top of mind, on the weekend, maybe you think of Keurig, or maybe you think of La Colombe when you're meeting a friend. So it's the situation that's influencing recall, and it's that fundamental reality of every single buyer experience. And any purchase arises as a result of that specific buying situation. So it's our job as marketers to think about what are those buying situations, and then for us to be present in as many of those buying situations as possible. So in other words, you want to grow what's called your situational awareness. And we also know this as mental availability, right? The brand that's remembered is the brand that's bought. It's not about top of mind. Also, it's about share of mind. So question, how do you then build situational awareness? Well, we need to start thinking in terms of situation. It's not about what buyers think about the brand. It's about when. So you want to understand situational cues by using this W's approach you can see on the slide. And the W's are a series of questions you can ask to determine why, when, where, with whom, and how people enter the market. So understanding these specific category buying situations, again, known as category entry points, allow you to develop creative that links your brand to them. So let's look at an example here. So there's no awareness independent of situations, which is why it's so critical. So we want to link our category entry points and link your brand to them. So easy to understand is critical here because out market buyers will not respond well to super technical messaging. And so I know we've said that we've talked about this in the past as we talk about where we can gain value and creativity. We want our messaging for out market buyers to, you know, really be attractive and memorable. And the messaging for out-market buyers tends to work for in-market buyers too, but the reverse is just not true. So here's an example to bring this to life. You can see this with Salesforce's Trailblazer campaign. So they wanted to own three buying situations, bringing customers and companies together, bringing government and citizens together, and then manufacturers and customers. So they crafted messaging that did just that. And then they did heavy branding and situational messaging to then link their brand to those key buying situations. And in doing so, they're investing in this contrarian and right advertising objective of situational awareness. So that wraps that trend and keep the questions coming in the chat, keep the comments coming in. I just wanna answer a question we got already from Madeline. So Madeline, you're wondering what is the book? Um, Katie Melkman, How to Change. I highly recommend it so far. I've only a little gotten a little bit into the book and it's it's been really great. Uh, so I wanna bring in my friends, Peter and John. 
here as we change over to the next set of trends. Are, are there any New Year's resolutions or anything in the chat that we should that we should talk about? Uh, also, we have a question from Mark that maybe we can answer before we go into the next section. Is situational awareness different for each person in the decision making unit? Any thoughts on this, guys? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it will be different. Different people will have different understandings or different knowledge of your mm -hmm. of your business and where you're strong. And, and obviously, they won't really know where you're weak. They won't think about it at all. But your job is really to build as much awareness as you can among as broad a group as possible. So you're not so much worried about every individual. You want to run kind of a broad reach mm -hmm. campaign that talks about all the key ideas so that you get essentially strong awareness across all of the buyers. So think about the aggregate, not as much about the individual, but it is a very good question. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we've learned from uh, Professor Romaniak who really originated a lot of these ideas. Like you wanna find a situation that has scale and that cuts across as many decision makers as you possibly can, and then you wanna focus on them. So there might be a million different buying situations, mm -hmm. but what are the one or three that'll drive the most commercial value for the business? And she has an amazing framework, actually, for how you prioritize them. But, you know, yes, they'll be different, but you really should try to focus on similarities versus differences, I would say. Awesome. OK, so with that, let's hand it over to Peter to take us through the next set of trends. So Peter, Thank you, Ty. Love those trends, by the way. Very memorable, very important concept. 95.5 rule, most buyers are out of market, you know, focusing less on brand awareness and more on situational awareness. I'm going to walk you through our next trend, the product delusion. So here's the question I would pose to all of you. Why are B2B ads so much worse than B2C ads? You know, please put me on the B2B accounts, said no creative director ever in the history of advertising. But why? You know, what explains that? I think the product delusion explains it. So our colleague at the B2B Institute, Mimi Turner, she's got this great joke. She likes to joke that if B2C marketers thought like B2B marketers, Coca-Cola would market itself as brown, fizzy, and sweet. So it would run rational, generic, creative, like you see here on the screen, right? The ads would try to convince buyers that Coke is 98% effective in reducing thirst and 79% more efficient than most bubble-based solutions. So Coke doesn't do that, of course, because their marketers are not crazy enough to believe that Coke competes with Pepsi on its product features and benefits. Uh, the issue is that most B2B organizations are crazy enough to believe that. And that's what we call the product delusion. It's the belief that brands compete primarily or exclusively on the quality of their product. The better the product, the stronger the sales. A classic example of the product delusion would be this quote from my close personal friend, Jeff Bezos who once said that advertising is the price you pay for having an unremarkable product or service. Now, in Jeffrey's defense, he has long since retracted this quote, and Amazon is now the largest advertiser on planet Earth. But this is still a remarkably common belief, uh, especially at technology companies. You know, most B2B companies are product-led organizations. They're not marketing-led. And if you go and ask the head of product, why the business is booming, I can pretty much guarantee you that the answer will be, spoiler alert, the product, right? It makes sense that product people think product is all that matters. To a hammer, everything looks like a nail. What doesn't make sense is that B2B marketers fall for the same delusion. We are obsessed with our products and we're always trying to communicate the superiority of our solutions by listing all the specs and recs. But is that the best strategy? Does the best product usually win? I would say no. So I would say the cure for the product delusion is a wonderful idea called satisficing. In 1956, an economist named Herbert Simon proved that contrary to conventional wisdom, Humans rarely make decisions based on a cost benefit analysis. Instead, we satisfy. So we choose the first acceptable solution, not the best possible solution. 
And we do that to conserve mental and physical energy and because it works. We don't have unlimited time or perfect information, so we have to settle for good enough products. This idea that buyers satisfice won Herbert Simon the Nobel Prize in economics. Now, the evidence suggests that most buyers in both B2B and B2C categories aren't looking far and wide for the best product. Our recent research with the Ehrenberg Bass Institute found that even in these high involvement purchases, very little evaluation occurs. So just as an example, when B2B buyers need a new financial service, 47% go straight to their existing bank. And 75% of those who claim to shop around also end up with their existing bank. And most buyers don't even consider more than two brands. So the truly rational B2B buyer would consider dozens of different banks, compare their product specifications and prices, and choose the best possible solution. The truly lazy B2B buyer would default to the brand they already know, which is what all of us do in practice. So what does this mean for you, dear attendees of our webinar? Well, I would say it means that your job as a marketer is not to prove to buyers that you have the best product, because that's not what influences their decisions. The problem isn't that buyers don't know enough about your products or don't like your products. The problem is that buyers don't even know your brand exists. That's what Ty was talking about with low brand awareness or situational awareness. And that's really the problem B2B marketers need to focus on solving. And you know, you don't solve it with this detailed, boring product marketing, which is especially irrelevant to the 95% of buyers who are out of market. You solve the situational awareness problem with entertaining, emotional brand advertising that cuts through and gets you remembered in a variety of different buying situations. All of our research at the B2B Institute over the past five years basically just says over and over again that that's the kind of marketing that drives the best financial performance. Now, we're not saying product doesn't matter. I can hear the product marketers shrieking at me through the computer screen. I'm not saying product doesn't matter. Uh, it does, but it doesn't matter as much as you think it does. And it really only matters up to a certain point if the product is good enough, not if it's the best product. Most B2B products are pretty similar. What's different is how easily they come to mind. I would also just ask you all to remember that at the end of the day, you know, B2B marketers don't control the product right? Marketing doesn't control product. So if product is all that matters, that means marketing doesn't matter. Luckily for all of us, marketing controls something much more important than product. We control the brand. Buyers don't choose the best product. Buyers choose the most familiar brand. The best product is the one you know. So we would say it's time to wake up from the product delusion and accept the market reality that companies ultimately compete on mental and physical availability. And that's the product delusion that we are all struggling with in the B2B marketing organization, really holding us back, if you ask me. Uh, and now I'll walk you through our next trend, which is called the peak end rule. And it comes to us from my wonderful colleague, Derek Yue. And to explain the idea, we're going to play a very fun game of would you rather. OK, you can even participate in a poll. Right. So would you rather these are your options stick your hand in freezing cold water for 60 seconds or stick your hand in freezing cold water for 90 seconds if the water gets slightly less cold in the final 30 seconds? Now, the rational human would choose option one. I'm assuming that's what you all chose in the poll. If you didn't, it's going to be very, very awkward for me. But when Daniel Kahneman, the legendary behavioral scientist, ran this experiment, 80% of participants chose the second option, 90 seconds in freezing cold water. Why? Because their memory of the second option was more pleasant than their memory of the first those ever so slightly warmer 30 seconds transform the way they remembered the experience, making it seem preferable to the first, even though the first is ostensibly a better experience. So that is the peak end rule. 
It's the idea that the memory of an experience is more important than the experience itself. And our memories are mostly based on the best or worst moment, the peaks, and on the end. So this is a kind of cognitive bias that you can ultimately use to your advantage. Let me give you an example. In my ancestral homeland of New York City, there is a little restaurant called 11 Madison Park. Many critics would tell you it is the best restaurant in the United States, in part because of its extraordinary customer experience. So as you can see here on this slide, dinner starts with cocktails and a kitchen tour, and it ends with free booze, sweet treats, and a take-home breakfast for the next morning. There is, of course, a catch. There's always a catch, which is that 11 Madison Park is outrageously expensive, and the low point of the experience is paying the bill. But 11 Madison Park uses the peak end rule to make sure that the bill doesn't spoil the memory. So like the free dessert comes after the bill. And then there's that take home oatmeal breakfast, which pretty much guarantees that you have a fond memory of the experience. So the customer experience ends on a high note, which brings people back, right? So I would say B2B marketers can also and should also apply the peak end rule because marketers, as Ty discussed, are really in the memory business after all. So in B2B, there's all this talk about the customer experience and the buying journey, but the peak end rule would suggest that not all parts of the journey carry equal weight. Some moments matter a lot more than others. And what marketers need to do is make sure that the journey has at least one positive peak and that each journey ends on a high note. We try to apply this principle here at the B2B Institute. So like pre-COVID, I would say the high point of working with the B2B Institute was our B2B Trends Dinners, which Ty and John, I'm sure you remember as fondly as I did. So we would invite our top clients to the best restaurant in town. We did it all over the world. We'd present our ideas and then we'd pair each idea with a relevant gourmet dish. Now, the low point of working with the B2B Institute is actually contracting with us. If you are lucky enough to participate in our revolutionary accelerator program, B2B Edge. But we try to make sure that procurement isn't the last thing you remember about the B2B Edge buying experience. So once our clients make it through contracting, we send a box set of all of our research along with a heartwarming welcome note and a framed picture of our charming Swiss boss, Jan Schwartz, blessed be his name. So the peak end rule also, I'll say, doesn't just apply to the customer experience. You can also apply it to your advertising. So the research says, and we got a slide on this, I think, you know, you really want to include the branding in your ad at the moment of peak emotional intensity and also at the end, because that's how you boost recall. So the data you're looking at here shows that brand recall is dramatically higher when you have multiple peaks or ending peaks in your ad and ideally you should have both. So that's the peak end rule. And I would say now in clear violation of the peak end rule, I'm going to turn the stage over to my beloved colleague and work husband, John Lombardo for our final two trends. John, darling, are you there? Yeah, they say you should look at actions and not words. And that's obviously why I am last and I am representing the peak end rule. Despite what you say, Peter, it is actions that matter more than words. I was shocked when I saw the agenda. I mean, it just didn't make sense to me, but that's fine, John. I wish you I mean, the best You've, no you've never understood the peak end rule, Peter. You've never understood it. Uh, wonderful to see everybody. Uh, delighted to be here. I'm going to talk to you about an idea we call central casting. Central casting, of course, is uh, the idea in Hollywood that there's a, literally a company called Central Casting that has cast people like Brad Pitt in movies. People would go out to Hollywood. They were kind of extras. They would go to Central Casting, and then they would try to get into the greatest movies of their day. Uh, it's a kind of famous idea. They say people are often straight out of Central Casting. And we're now going to talk a little bit about um, characters because characters are what central casting is all about. Uh, people generally really don't like using characters in B2B advertising, uh, which we have always found quite entertaining. And I'll get a bit into that. But um, let's just start with a, a thought experiment. You know, B2B marketers 
uh, we're all storytellers. That is the reality of the situation. And of course, there are no great stories without great characters. And in order to prove that point, I'm going to ask you to engage in this, this little thought experiment with me. Imagine trying to describe Star Wars without any of the characters. All you would be left with as you know, are things like spaceships and, and lightsabers. I have to say the lightsabers thing is uh, it's not bad. You know, lightsabers are a pretty revolutionary product. Uh, I think we can agree they are the best uh, lightsaber, the best uh, kind of like, you know, energy sword on the market. But the reality of the situation is you can't get that excited about an energy sword, at least not for a long period of time. We don't really relate to products. We relate more to people. And the way we relate to Star Wars isn't through you know, the products, it's of course through the characters. I mean, we care a lot about Luke and Leia and R2-D2 and Darth and Yoda. And of course now baby Yoda, who is one of the most famous animated characters of the last, you know, five years or so. So in general, you know, you really couldn't tell the story of Star Wars without talking about all the characters and kind of the challenges that they overcome. And the reality of that situation or this situation is as it relates to marketing is, you know, Hollywood understands the importance of characters. Every story is built around characters. I think B2B marketers, sorry, B2C marketers also really understand the value of characters. I mean, think of all of the wonderful brands that are basically built using characters. The Geico Gecko, Orlov the Meerkat, if you're in the UK, the M&Ms, Red and Yellow, the Most Interesting Man in the World from Dos Equis, the Michelin Man, Mr. Clean, Energizer Bunny, Tony the Tiger. I could go on and on. Uh, characters are really how many consumer brands are built, but there just isn't, for whatever reason, a willingness to use characters in the world of B2B. But let's talk a little bit about characters in B2B, because you know what? There's a lot of great evidence. People get so caught up on the idea of using a character, they think it's too silly, but it's not silly. The data makes very clear that characters aren't silly, they're serious. And in fact, System One, a partner of ours, did this wonderful analysis where they looked at characters in B2B advertising. And they found that if you looked at ads that didn't have a character, and you compare them to ads that did have a character, you see that brand recall or what they call fluency is twice as high. So you get Literally, your recall doubles if you use a character in your ads. So there's this crazy idea that, you know, we shouldn't use characters in B2B. They're not, they're silly, but they're not. They're, they're very serious. And they're serious about producing great business outcomes. Because I think, as we said earlier, you know, marketers are in the memory business. And you can only buy what you remember. And characters help you to be remembered. You know, every B2B marketer should be very serious about characters. Yet, as you can see here, only like 1% of ads feature any kind of character. It's very sad. It makes me think that, in fact, B2B marketers aren't quite as serious as they think, and they're a little bit more or a lot more silly than they think. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about how you might use characters in B2B, because there tends to be this focus just on the animated characters like Astro from Salesforce or the Geico Gecko, and people think that's a silly idea, but there's frankly a lot of ways to use characters. People need to be a little bit less literal about the input, and they need to focus a little bit more on the output, which is better recall. And there's lots of ways to do that. You can use an animated character. That's a wonderful idea. You can also use celebrities, of course. Christian Slater is the wolf in the HP ads. You've also got uh, Flo from Progressive. You know, she's essentially an employee. And then, of course, you can use your own employees, your own customers, real people too. You don't have to just use celebrities or fake people like characters or animated characters. So you know, really take seriously the value characters bring in building brand and building brand recall and honestly making your brand likable and memorable. Um, and I want to leave you with a mnemonic here, something to remember, kind of a bit of a jingle because jingles are a form of a character. If you want people to remember, cast your character front and center. Want people to remember, cast your character front and center. That is my jingle for you, my own character or brand character for this trend, central casting. We will now move on to another idea we are very fond of, which we call reach maximalism. I want you all for a second just to admire this beautiful graphic. We have an M. The M is taking flight. And you can see those kind of wings there. This is the idea of reach taking flight in the most maximally glorious way, reach maximalism. And we're going to move on to, in some ways, um, a bit of an eternal question in the world of advertising. What is better, big reach or heavy frequency? And when I say better, what produces better ROI? It's a question that a lot of people have thought about and talked about, you know, going back probably 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, and I think the answer is surprising to many people. 
Um, but if you had to actually determine what I want to reach a million people once, or would I rather reach 500,000 people twice? Uh, the answer is actually that you'd rather reach a million people once, not 500,000 people twice. There's lots of very complicated ways to explain this idea. Uh, ideas around sales response and a convex response curve. That's the very complicated uh, academic explanation. But there's actually a really wonderful study that happened a couple of years ago. It was run by Nielsen. And they looked at three different cohorts of people. They looked at a low frequency segment that saw something like one and a half ads on average. They looked at a medium frequency segment that looked at something like four and a half ads on average. And then they looked at a high frequency segment that saw something like 10 ads on average. And then they just divided the sales they got. They divide the sales by the number of impressions that each of those people saw, the frequency that they saw. And what they found is the low frequency segment only required two ads to produce a 1% increase in sales. The medium group required 4.7 impressions to drive a 1% increase in sales. And the high segment required 7.3 impressions to create that same 1% lift in sales. So again, low is about two, medium is about 4.7, and high is about 7.3, all to produce 1% increase in sales. Obviously, you want as few impressions as possible. That's the lowest cost in order to produce 1% increase in sales. So the low frequency segment is by far the highest ROI. And of course, when you run low frequency, high reach, which is kind of the sweet spot, you not only get the wonderful efficiency, you also get the effectiveness, a lot of scale and a lot of ROI, which is an amazing idea and what we should all endeavor to be doing. Um, another way to put this is simply that uh, the medium segment was essentially um, like two and a half times more expensive and the high frequency segment is like three and a half times more expensive. So you don't want as much frequency as you think. You want more reach than you realize. Um, and in some ways, you can think about this as, you know, high frequency strategies reduce ROI by showing too much excess frequency or paying for too much excess frequency. So it's a really very compelling study that answers this kind of eternal question on would I rather have a lot of reach or a lot of frequency. You want a lot of reach. Now I'm going to back off a little bit from the math, the ROI, and I'm going to look a little bit more just at some of the logic that underpins this idea. Um, and in fact... You know, think a little bit about your media strategy as kind of like running hurdles at the Olympics. You know, you've got to get over the first hurdle before you can even think about the second hurdle or the third hurdle or the fourth hurdle. And in fact, this is why we are reach maximalists. Reach is the number one thing. You've got to reach people before you can possibly get their attention. And only if you reach people and get their attention can you possibly build memories around your brand and linking your brand to buying situations. Remember, marketers are in the memory business. And of course, only if you reach people and get their attention and build that memory, are you likely to actually win the purchase. So you've got to just remember sequence matters. That is the key idea. Sequence matters. And the first step in the all important sequence of driving sales with advertising is reach. This is why we are reach maximalists. Reach maximalism. Let's talk a little bit about how you practically can apply these ideas. Yeah, linkedin.com backslash ads, linkedin.com backslash ads. It is a free tool where you can not only size up an audience, you can go find out that there's 7 million, for example, um, folks in IT in the United States. So now that you've kind of figured out exactly how broad an audience you want to target, everybody in IT, that's 7 million people. You can actually go into LinkedIn. You can say, I want to reach 7 million people and I want to reach them with the brand awareness objective. And within the brand awareness objective, you actually get to choose whether you want to optimize for impressions, which you don't actually want because impressions will give you more frequency. Uh, what you want is reach, which as you can see here is recommended because reach will give you lots of unique reach against the audience. So we're even obviously in our tool giving the option of reach and frequency. I just described that you actually generally only need one or two impressions in a short period of time in order to generate a sale. You don't need five impressions or 10 impressions, but really you want a lot of reach and you want to space out your impressions over time. That is the right way to pace and space your media to reach as many category buyers as possible and not overpay and not underpay, just pay exactly what you need in order to generate the sales you need to grow. This is the right optimization of your budget. Um, you know, reach isn't just about advertising. I think reach in general is just kind of like a mental model. You always want more reach, not less reach. It just allows you to essentially spread your costs over a broader audience and it makes things more cost effective. You could think about reach as kind of a litmus test, as we say here. 
You know, you want to reach as many people as possible on your budget. You want to have as many people come to the event as possible on your budget. You want to have as many people come to dinner. I mean, you want reach in everything that you do, whether it be sales or marketing or product, you know, and again, reach when you can get a lot of reach that allows you to spread the cost over a bigger base. And it allows you to have a higher ROI, allows you to make more profit. It allows you to be more successful. All of the biggest brands in the world are the biggest brands in the world because they have a lot of customers because they reach a lot of customers. So that is how we think about reach and reach maximalism. So um, we will stop there and bring back in my wonderful colleagues, but not Peter. (laughs) Hi, Ty. Great to see you. (laughs) Oh. <laughs> Hi, can we just agree that no one's going to hire John to write jingles? I mean, John, well, what's going I on mean, here? Why I mean, to people to remember, I mean, cast your brand I front and center. I think you're trying to get signed. Like, you try, like John, is, uh, John is out here trying to get the contract. Yeah, and it's not I'm working, not, Ty. It's not working at all. <laughs> I'm not going to get between y'all, though. So leave you, don't want it, you don't want it, Ty. You know Ty, you couldn't. You couldn't. Uh, yeah, you can't. Not I like, know. This, mar- this marriage is ironclad. Your love is too strong. It's too strong. And I love it. And I love it. Uh, great. So we've covered some ground here. I want to actually bring in some questions. I want to bring in the poll results and let's chat folks keep the questions coming. So we're going to, cause we're going to get to Q and a right now. Uh, also, now that we've covered the trends, I want to hear from you. What was the top trend you heard today that you plan to explore? So we'll visit that in just a moment. Want to hear from you. What was the trend that you, after this will dive into and want to learn more about? So with that, uh, going back to the, let's talk about the peak end rule really quick. Cause I, I know Peter, you were like, okay, would you rather dip your finger for like 60 seconds or is it 90 seconds with a with temperature increase? So 85% of people chose option A and 15% of people chose option B, which is understandable. Yeah, well, Ty, yeah. This, is, this is the difference between stated and revealed preferences. Mm. You, know, you ask people, of course, they would make the logical decision. If you actually test it in the wild, doesn't look it's like basically the opposite of that in practice, according to Daniel Kahneman. But you know, he's just a Nobel Prize winning behavioral scientist. <laughs> so you know, Ty, what does he know? What do well, what do you know? What do you know? Uh, and then we have some questions from the audience to get to as well. So we have, let's get to some questions. So we have from Bernice. So Bernice says, so are we advertising to target audience or just anyone for that memory? And I think this goes back to the conversation of reach and category, reaching everyone in the category. So any thoughts there, folks? So this is something that's really critical. Yeah, I mean, I can just say that you do care about on target reach or category reach. You really want to reach people that are in your category that will buy your products or services. You know, if you are, for example, as Peter always likes to say, if you are selling toothpaste, you want to target everyone with teeth. If you are selling, you know, for example, cloud computing, uh, teeth isn't the way to determine who to target. It's probably targeting everybody in IT, you know, so something like 7 million people. That's really what you want to do is you want to figure out who's actually on the buying committee. If it's cloud computing, it's going to be mostly IT people. There's going to be people from finance. There's going to be people from marketing, for sales, from procurement. You want to basically build that buying committee. And it looks more like millions of people rather than hundreds of people. But that's mm-hmm. what you care about. B2B is different from B2C in that way. The targeting does matter more. And there's this wonderful platform called LinkedIn that can help you with that. What a platform. I think what one wrinkle I would add that I think is important is, you know, Ty, the first point you made is how important it is to think over long periods of time. Mm-hmm. And something we've seen in the data and that also just makes a lot of sense is that people move between segments over time. Right. So who buys the category today is not necessarily the same audience as who will be buying it in 10 years. A classic example, I think we've probably been sharing this one for years, but like every tech client we work with, they only want to reach IT managers. Like God forbid they show a single impression to a junior IT person, except like guess who's going to become an IT manager in a few years? The junior IT people that are deliberately being excluded from every campaign, right? Young people eventually become old people, a shocking revelation. I know, please don't shoot the messenger. So I think John's right. You got to focus on category buyers, what you said too, Ty. But I think you also got to think broadly about who might become a category buyer in the future. So actually the circle is like even a little bigger than who can buy today, right? It's also buy tomorrow. 
Right. Don't we make a lot reach. of assumptions. We make a lot of assumptions that we know who will buy from us in the future and who's buying from us now. Right? Yeah, totally. Totally. Right. Everybody thinks they know exactly who it's going to be. We can predict the future. We know it's, you know, the like IT director in Cincinnati at the pharmaceutical company with 10,000 employees. There's a lot of uncertainty in the universe. Very hard to know exactly yes. what people are going to do in the future. I think the the broad reach strategy John outlined, you know, mm -hmm. that's how you hedge against the uncertainty in people's careers. Absolutely. So we have a related question here that puts the lens of situational buying on this. And I want to get this correct. I'm not, I may not pronounce your name correctly. Uh, Deva or Diva asked this question. So apologies if I did not say your name correctly. Um, so situational buying is a hard one to solve in B2B because buying decisions happen within a committee rather than with the individual. So how should we be thinking about it is the question there. Yeah, there's a good answer to this as well. You know, you want to understand essentially what you want to do in B2B is you want to go talk to 50 of your buyers. You know, some of them could be current customers of yours. Some of them can be potential future customers, but you want to go talk to them and you want to ask them a series of questions like why do they buy your products and services? You know, how do they buy them? Where do they buy them? Who else do they buy them with? You know, what are they looking to do with them? So there's a series of W questions you can use. If you ask 50 people those W's, you get a whole bunch of responses. You know, they're each going to give you three or four responses, 50 people, three responses, 150 responses. You can actually look at the 150 responses and find what's common among them. And people have more shared problems than we realize. Like we think yeah. everybody has different problems. <laughs> In business, people mostly have the same problems. So, you know. Essentially, you can find the most common problems through those 150 responses. Those are the biggest buying situations that are the most common among all of your buyers. That's what you want to talk about with your advertising. That's what you want to measure with your surveys around, did I build brand awareness around that specific buying situation mm -hmm. that most people told me about? So, you know, right. you don't. that's why you don't worry about a single person. You talk to 50 people, get the three responses, and you're kind of playing kind of the odds with a bigger pool. It's reach maximalism for responses, not just reach maximalism for ads. Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> also, I, you know, I think market research, as you outlined, is like the best answer. There is a kind of like budget answer also, I would say, which is to talk to your salespeople. Like the benefit of B2B is that there's usually a huge sales force. They spend an enormous amount of time with the customers and they can kind of tell you what the different buying situations are that arise and maybe give you some indication of which ones are more common or less common or more credible or less credible. Um, so sometimes it's even just talking internally to people to get a sense of what those CEPs or buying situations right. might be like. Yeah, that's a great thing to do for efficiency's sake as well. Learn, learn from your own teams, focus right. on those things. And also, of course, talking to your customers as well to get the, the most common areas. So I, I love that. Uh, I want to actually bring in, shout out to Leisha, uh, who said, living life as a satisficer is much more fulfilling then the alternative being a maximizer. You end up with more time and less gray hair. So very, very, very deep I reflection. Yeah. I totally, totally agree. Shout out, shout out to you, Leisha. Who has time to find the best product? Nobody, nobody has time for that. Right, Ima imagine like, I mean, I know when I'm looking for a, like all, the, I'm looking at all the different airlines, I'm going through, I'm just like, you know what, if I just made a choice, I would have all that time back. You yeah. Know? Actually, I have a short, I have a short personal tale I can tell you, Ty. Do we have time for a yeah. short personal tale? We, we do. We do. My wife, uh, my wife recently chose a new car for us. She chose this Mazda. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, I'm like, why'd you choose, why'd you choose this car? You know, we all work in marketing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm sure you guys all do market research on uh, everyone in your life. So, you know, my wife was like, well, I chose it because it was the best car. And that is generally what consumers say. If you ask them why they made the choice, they'll always say because it was the best product. So I said, oh, really? okay, yeah. So she said, yeah, I just Googled what's the best car. And I was like, great. So Mazda was number one. And my wife's like, no, of course not. Number one was some weird brand I'd never heard of. But like Mazda was number three and I'd heard of it. So I chose Mazda. So in other words, like, it's not just I'm looking for the best product. It's like, am I familiar with the product? And in many ways, you'll choose mm -hmm. the more familiar brand over what is technically considered the best product in a category. Just right. to save time, and because it generally it's, is like a good way of making decisions. Great, it's a it's a great mental model for making decisions. Absolutely. So I'd want to share the results from the poll, 
and then I, we have a request to talk about the peak end rule. So we'll get to your question or comment in just a moment, Sophia. So for the poll results about which trends people will be exploring over the next year or so, we'll have 50% said situational awareness. So that was number one, followed by 21% product delusion. 24% peak end rule. So that was actually, that was actually number two, um, close third reach maximalism. So tie for 21% between product illusion and 95.5 and coming in last is central casting, but still very important to think about characters in your marketing. So those are- People the hate characters, Ty. By the way, going back to the contrarian matrix, when everybody hates an idea, it means there's usually a lot of value in that idea. So mm. I yeah. love characters so much is because nobody's doing it, that just makes it 10 times more. I'm fun. actually really impressed by how much people continue to hate the ideas of the idea of characters in they advertising do, and advertising. I mean, yeah. we've never written yeah. about it or talked about it anywhere where everyone didn't hate on. I just showed data that it literally doubles your recall. So I guess people just want to be remembered less, be bought less and have a job for less time. I guess that's the only thing I can take away from. Is this satisfying? Is this maximizing? It seems like neither. I don't know. It's just a crazy world we live in. Everybody yeah. hates characters. I mean, we'll do it. We'll do it. And I, I'm curious for the audience, what is your favorite B2B brand character? Let us know in the chat. I'm very curious to know that. Um, so going to Sophia's question, and then we'll go to you, Michelle. So Sophia is asking about the peak end rule. Can you please like explain it quickly again. Um, so again, I think this was the restaurant example here, Peter. Yeah, I mean, it's just that like, you would think when you're evaluating an experience, you just think about the sum total of it and every moment in it, and you take a kind of average of that experience. It turns out that's not actually how people remember and evaluate experiences it. They assign a weird or irrational amount of weight to whatever the best or worst moment is and to the end, because the end is the most recent thing, so you remember it the best. So it's really like when you're designing experiences and you want to design good experiences, people remember so that they buy it again, so they come back to the restaurant or, you know, so they choose the cloud computing solution again. You really want to focus on those peaks and on the ending. That's where you'll get the kind of most bang for your buck in terms of improving the customer experience, because that's actually what people assign more weighting to. So it's really just a sort of like quirk of how people remember experiences. But I think one that's important to keep in mind since marketers are somewhat obsessed with the customer experience. I mean, I think we've been saying for years, actually marketers should focus on the non-customer experience since that's really what marketers uniquely have control over. But for those of you in the customer experience obsessed camp, I think at least the peak end rule is a nice uh, contrarian take on how to think about optimizing it. Yeah, there's a great example with Tiffany's. When you when you make a big purchase, you get to go into the back room, you champagne. At least I've heard that's the case. I've not done that. <laughs> yeah, but it's an application of the peak end rule as well as an exactly. example. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so let's get to a question from Michelle and John, I want to toss this one to you since, since you covered the jingles and you were, I mean, almost, you know, again, going for that, that record contract yourself. Um, the question from Michelle is, do we have similar research on the use of jingles and sounds? Yeah, there is good research on this. There is a book called How Not to Plan that looks at the highest performing ads over the last couple of decades. And you'd be amazed by how many of the top performing ads have really great songs or really great jingles. Um, in general, sound is probably deeply underrated, deeply underused in all ads. A lot of it has to do with just the fact that, um, you know, sounds and soundtracks work in a lot of different mediums. So, you know, you can be in another room and the TV can be on. And this happens to me all the time. I'll be in the kitchen. I won't even be looking at the TV and I'll hear Liberty, 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 Liberty. And I'm like, oh, that's the Liberty Mutual ad, right? So a tagline like that with mm -hmm. sound can work in a TV ad. It can work on radio. You know, it can work online with video. It just, it tends to work very well. And in general, like we are storytelling creatures. So we're used to hearing stories and repeating stories and jingles because they often rhyme and are memorable or easy to then repeat and pass on. So they're very mimetic. They're very memeable. Yeah, I think it's also just important, again, going back to the contrarian thing, Ty, it's like, 
what is the most commonly used creative elements in most B2B ads? It's basically generic voiceover and some like fast cut scenes with a bunch of product benefits flashing right. on the screen. So mm -hmm. that's what everyone's doing. Uh, you know, there's an open question as to how effective that is. Research suggests not that effective. But the bigger point is like, you want to not be doing what everybody else is doing because you want to stand out and you want to find a competitive edge. So things like characters and jingles, which absolutely appalls most B2B marketers and they'd never even consider putting in their ads, Ooh, that yeah. not only gets the best performance, but nobody's doing it. So you're the only one who gets the best performance. So again, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry everyone hates us for our jingle and we characters. Gotta, yeah, we got we to gotta make a jingle in characters, folks. Like we got to do it. Um, I'm with if it. you want um, people to remember, cast your brand front and center. I heard that up with I heard everybody's been saying that. I actually I hear mean, people saying that outside in the streets. You know, and it's just totally gone viral. Yeah, yeah I mean, it will. If, right. if you just, it's an earworm. If you just keep saying it, oh, it gets totally there. So catchy. <laughs> like songs that, that people love. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I know we're going to try to get to as, as many questions as we can. We've got a survey of, uh, which is available now, please let us know. We want to make sure we're delivering values. So let us know how you felt. Um, we're going to try to do some rapid fire to get through a couple more questions before we run out of time here. Um, question from Dagmar. Um, is, it, is what's important, reach, frequency, both? Uh, let's talk about that. Ooh, I'm going to go with the contrarian take. It's not reach and frequency. It's reach and recency. Um, you know, break it down, John. Wow. Well, number one, reach is what matters the most. We just, we went over that in excruciating detail. It felt excruciating mm -hmm. for me. I don't know about the rest of you, but it was excruciating. I can tell you, but reach really is the number one thing. And you want to space your reach over time because ideally you want your impression to be as close to purchase as possible because you cannot predict when people are going to buy. Your best bet is literally to take your budget and just kind of slice it into 52 different parts and spend one fifty second of your budget every week. That way you're always somewhat close. You're getting maximum reach over time, but you're also spreading out the reach. So you're getting recency over time as well. So, you know, this is actually a way where people try to overcomplicate budgeting. Really people can be very simple about budgeting. Just divide it by 12 and one twelfth every month or divide it by 52, one fifty second every week. That'll give you reach and frequency. That's better than reach, sorry, reach and recency, which is better than reach and frequency. Also, memories decay, right? So eventually people forget the memory of the brand, and that's why you need to remind them. So I don't think we're saying, like, never reach the person again, but it's, like, to John's point, spacing it out over time versus, like, showing somebody an ad 900 times in a row. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want – like, you've probably all seen this if you watch – especially online platforms, but TV, you'll often see the same ad, maybe in the same break, same commercial break. And that's yep. just, that's just, that's criminal. That's a criminal yeah. waste of money. Criminal. Right? The market failure, John. Yeah, it is. It is sad. It's very sad. So sad, mm. so sad, so sad. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Ben um, says, how do you explain and defend uh -oh. long-term? Yeah, he's, Ben wants to like, he's like, help me, let me go do this. He says, how do you explain and defend long-term brand awareness mindset to people who are very short-term thinkers? Uh, one of our passion topics. This is. I mean, I think, Ty, you really made the best point about future cash flows. Uh, this is another recurring theme of the B2B Institute. Mm -hmm. All the B2B marketers we talked to are trying to get closer to sales. Salespeople are generally very short-term thinkers because they are compensated on a quarterly basis, and they're not paid based on how many people buy an Aston Martin 50 years from now. The finance department actually is trained to think long term because most businesses are valued based on their future cash flows. Mm -hmm. I would say 80 percent of the value of the stocks based on future cash flows. So I think one of the things is just to actually like choose who you take this type of thinking to. Uh, you know, sales is obviously like the obvious one that usually comes to mind, but there's actually paid probably a bigger opportunity to take the finance teams who usually right. secretly run the marketing department by setting our budgets mm -hmm. and approving what we can do. So I think anchoring brand as a driver of future cash flows and not like a fun arts and crafts project, which is usually how it's positioned today. Uh, that would be one thing we've seen work pretty well. Absolutely. So, uh, anything you would add? I mean, just that we need to start speaking more financial language, which you yep. said, sum it up. We need to start speaking that way. And we are so we are short on time. Um, but John, Peter, any quick thing to leave us with, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Folks, do feel free to connect with us because we can an still answer the questions here. 
Yeah, we'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. John, you want to sing a jingle one last time? I don't know, maybe Limu, Emu, Farmer. B2B, I, 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 B2B,